And here we are at Voice of the Vatican. I am very happy to welcome Monsignor Anthony Figueredo. Welcome to Voice of the Vatican. Monsignor. I've always wanted to be here, so it's a real pleasure. Thanks, Ashley. Well, Monsignor, you, of course, have been in Rome for many years. You are certainly a, a fixture here. <laughs> Everyone knows Monsignor Figueredo and all of the good work that you do. And we'd like to talk with you today about one of the projects that you've been busy working on, which is especially with relations with China. Monsignor, would you tell us a bit about your work and how that came to be? Very much in the line of Pope Francis, actually. Pope Francis looks to build bridges. Prior to his pontificate, under Pope Benedict, in fact, the great earthquake in the south of China was an opportunity for the Vatican office dealing with charity, for which I worked, to go out to China. I was chosen to go out, and it was in the course of that disaster that God brought good. Mm. In fact, building a dialogue, building a relationship, particularly with the Chinese bishops, but also with the Chinese government. Wow. And so how long has this been going on, this project? I would say for about eight years now. And since that time, the bishops have invited myself back each year together with another gentlemen to come and give their yearly retreat. So it's a real opportunity to, in fact, diffuse what has been happening at the Vatican, the teaching of the church, the great hope of the church to the bishops in China. The great difficulty in China is formation mm. and particularly how the bishops uh, receive information. So, in fact, it's such a privilege to go out, give this information, dialogue with the bishops, and again, it builds bridges. Of course. And Monsignor, what does that mean for your personal safety while there? Are there any concerns attached to that? Particularly when we go out, uh, in fact, we are officially invited by the government I and see. by the bishops, mm -hmm. but remember that China is 1.4 billion people, so one never knows sure. who one is going to meet on the roads. I was there this past summer, and we went to one of the four Catholic churches in Beijing. Mm. And it's interesting just preaching in that church to many, many Catholics, both from the official church and the underground church. But again, I never know who's entering. It could be mm -hmm. a special agent, it could be a policeman. And I have heard of situations that you're just arrested and accompanied to the airport, or perhaps even worse still. So there is definitely a danger, but I always feel especially protected by the Lord and by the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know that China is dedicated to Our Lady. Hmm. Well, you're certainly in good hands then, that's for sure. So, Monsignor, of course, Christianity is growing in China, which is an exciting fact to know. And I imagine that the people with whom you're ministering or to whom you're ministering are just hungering for the faith. What are some of the messages that you share with them? It's a 24-7 nation, in fact. There's people on the streets mm. all the time. Mm. And I often think of St. Francis Xavier, who would say, I'd like to get all those students out of the Sorbonne or in the universities and go out and simply preach to these people to whom the good news of Jesus Christ has never been announced. Yes, Christianity is growing, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of the difficulty is that it's growing, particularly amongst non-Catholic churches. For us, that's a difficulty because of mm -hmm. the Vatican-Sino relations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of stymied the growth mm -hmm. of the Roman Catholic Church. So part of my mission is to go out and to build that bridge in order that this confidence is rebuilt. Particularly important, and particularly important, having just completed the Year of Mercy, so. is the reconciliation between what we call the official church belonging to the Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association, government-related, and the underground church. Years, years of division, sure. years of misunderstanding, but I have seen with my own eyes and touched with my own hands that these Catholics on both sides wish the reconciliation that Pope Francis so often speaks about. Praise God, that is so exciting to hear, Monsignor. And uh, one of the fruits that has been born of this ministry is that it's not only you and others who are traveling to China, but a delegation from China was right here in Rome recently. Would you tell us about that? One of the bridges that uh, the church is building is through Pope Francis's writing on climate change, Laudato Si. 
And so the official agency for climate change, for pollution, sent a delegation to the Pontifical Academy for Sciences last mm. week, it included an ex-minister who in fact was the son, is the son, of one of China's former leaders. So he is particularly important in relaying messages back to the Chinese government. Sure. It's important because this is a typical area that we can share. We're all concerned about the environment. Obviously, we see it from a spiritual side. Perhaps the Chinese see it more from a materialistic side. But the common ground builds the trust on which relations can be built for the growth of the church and the good of people. Ultimately, we all wish the good of people. That's the business that the Catholic Church is yes, in, right? Absolutely. We right. see person by person. Yes. And remember, a fifth of the world's population is in China. Wow. Wow, such an important ministry to reach out. And Monsignor, to find that common ground is such an important way to evangelize. It really is. And I believe it's the way Pope Francis, perhaps sometimes he's misunderstood, but his idea of the church as a field hospital is one I very much share. Mm. We need to bring people and meet them where they are first of all, before we are able to lead them step by step to embrace the full teaching of the church, which is ultimately good news. You know that often we talk, Ashley, about uh, the law of graduality and the graduality of the law. And what we are saying is we're not grading the law. We're not talking about situation ethics, that the teaching of the church is different for each person. No, we present the full teaching of the church at an appropriate time, but we take people to that teaching step by step, particularly in moral issues. It was different in the past where society was largely Christian. We had the Christian family. We had the local parish, mm -hmm. we had the Catholic school. So people received that, uh, yes. that grounding. We don't have that today. So we're meeting people where they are and saying, yes, we understand that you haven't had this formation in the past, but we want to take you there little by little, step by step. It's such an exciting thought, especially as we have concluded this year of mercy. We all know, as Pope Francis has reminded us, that although the year is finished, mercy never finishes. And in the example you just gave, Father, I think that's inspirational to all of us to reach out to those around us and accompany them step by step to bring them closer and closer to the faith because nobody can respond to something being thrown at them or, or shoved at them. So we have to do it in those small baby steps to which you're referring, Monsignor. One needs to look at the person in front of them. Mm -hmm. I often recall what Saint Teresa of Calcutta would say, she said, would say that we need to love, we need to begin to love and always starting with the person next to us. And it's always marked my relationship, particularly with three pontiffs who mm. I've known quite well, St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict and now Pope uh, Francis, that each person in front of them, it's as if you're the only one Beautiful. that matters. And, uh, Imagine if all our relationships, I speak for myself, imagine all our relationships were like that, this world would change. And I truly believe that this is what Jesus did. Uh, he looked at the adulterous woman, or he looked at Zacchaeus and uh, entered their reality. And uh, because they encountered mm. him, encountered him, as one who was merciful, you know, the word mercy is one who looks at my misery, they began to trust him mm. and began to change their lives through the power of grace, through the yes. power of Jesus' grace. We must all pray for that grace to, to be able to be Christ to all of those around us. Absolutely. Oh. Monsignor, can we talk a little bit about your relationship with these three amazing popes and the continuity amongst the three? Absolutely. All great popes, and we know that uh, the Lord has given us the popes we need at a particular moment in time, mm -hmm. how blessed we are. I often say that St. John Paul II, you know, he was the great uh, figure who went out to all parts of the world. He was young, he was energetic, he was popular, he had great teaching, but he opened 
the hearts of people through his apostolic voyages. I think the most traveled person in the history of the world. We then had Pope Benedict, a wise, older pope, but so smart and and we're like a father of the mm. church. And the heart that was open then needed filling. Mm. And I think that just the teachings of Pope Benedict, he could say something in a few words that we would take <laughs> yes. hundreds of pages to write. He filled our hearts. Now with Pope Francis, he's saying to us, your hearts have been opened, your hearts have been filled. What are you going to do with this now? Mm. And he's saying to us, go out into the peripheries proclaim this good news, give this good news particularly to those who are poor, both materially and spiritually, in order that they may meet Jesus Christ and his love for them. Wow, it's certainly been exciting to, to be part of these moments in history and to be uh, under the reign of these amazing popes that we've had once in history. I think so, and after every council of the church, the Lord has always raised up saints mm. yes. and I really believe that these popes are holy men and I truly believe that he's raising up other saints not just those who are canonized like Saint Teresa of Calcutta, Saint Padre Pio but also ordinary people and mm. to be a saint in this age holiness is such an important part of uh, what we are living today is truly to be faithful to the call that God has placed in our lives. You know, one can be peeling potatoes in a kitchen, yes. or one can be preaching uh, in missions throughout the world, but if we do God's will, then we are holy and rely on God's grace to increase in that holiness. And it seems like such a simple formula. Doesn't it's it? so simple, but it's the, it's the formula of someone like Saint Therese yes. of Lisieux. Uh, she would say, you know, just do simple things with great love mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's quite amazing because um, wh when we do that uh, with great love, we, we focus on the present, mm. focus on the present. I often think that if we focus on the past, we focus on the future, we don't live the present and it inhibits our freedom yes. really to live in this moment. And it's part of original sin, <laughs> you know, that original sure. sin that uh, our fathers, Adam and Eve, they were always looking for another reality than the one in which God had placed them. It's amazing, isn't it? Because you have a beautiful garden, uh, you have all the fruits, <laughs> everything, right. and, and you look, you, you're looking for something else. And I think that so often that happens in our married lives, in the priesthood, mm -hmm. in, in schools, our workplaces. And it's important to understand that you know, God has put me here. Again, I keep going back yes. to Teresa of Calcutta, but Teresa of Calcutta would say, you know, to surrender each day. And she mm. said, if God puts you in a, a palace one day, she would say, well, accept to be in that palace. Not that you're looking for it, but right. accept to be there. If tomorrow you find yourself in the street, uh, accept to be there. Not that you're looking for it, but realizing that God will bring good from it. This is what Christianity yes. proclaims uh, through the power of the resurrection that uh, death never has the last word, tragedy never has the last word, and even the greatest tragedies in life, even the greatest sins, oh happy fault, yes. deserve so great a Savior. It's so true. St. Paul talks about how he learned to live with and without, and of course we're called to, to be present in whatever reality the Lord has placed us because, of course, we trust that it's for a reason. You know, God's power is made perfect in weakness. And mm. in fact, this whole time that we're living in with so many difficulties and so many sufferings and so many problems, you know, earthquakes and floods and mm -hmm. tsunamis, uh, we need hope. Yes. We need great hope that uh, God is powerful and God is in charge and that uh, he is never overcome by evil, but overcomes yes. evil with good. Yes. Monsignor Figueredo, who are some saints that have been especially influential to you, who really touched your heart? In my bedroom, I have the relics of some hundred saints. Oh, how special! <laughs> Including the blood of Padre Pio, the blood of St. John Paul II, and the blood of, of mm -hmm. Teresa of Calcutta. Saints that have been very special to me, St. Francis Xavier. Yes. I stem from Goa, 
originally, and St. Francis Xavier brought the faith to Goa. And in, in a very simple way, uh, he would go into the villages and the, the children who were uncatechized, he would ring a bell and they would run there and he would teach them just very simple prayers. And through that very, very uh, primitive form of preaching, he changed an entire yes. landscape. And thanks to him, I am Roman Catholic. It, it's the typical case of one person can change a generation. Mm. So St. Francis is very, very special to me. I've just been visiting actually another great saint, mm -hmm. the founder of the Redemptorist, St. Alphonsus Liguri. Yes. And St. Alphonsus Liguri from Naples, and very beautifully he too was involved in the great work of giving retreats, of preaching, the importance of the sacraments, of the confessional. And particularly, I, I learned this in his in his uh, writings and also in his statutes for the Redemptorists mm -hmm. that uh, if someone does something wrong to us that part of their statutes is never to defend yourself mm -hmm. and allow God to uh, ultimately bring the justice from there. And it's tough. It but is. Uh, it's tough, but it, it really corresponds to the call of Jesus that we are asked to pray for our enemies, we're asked mm -hmm. to do good for them, we're asked to turn the other cheek, and we're asked to uh, go the extra mile. So these saints are particularly inspiring for me. Obviously someone like St. John Paul II, mm -hmm. who I knew personally, and Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta. I always remember St. Teresa of Calcutta. I met her here in Rome many times and we corresponded, but I asked her once actually, I, I'd just been ordained a priest maybe less than a year, and mm. I met her in Rome, and I was going through a little bit of a difficult time mm. in my priesthood. Mm -hmm. You know, the honeymoon was so sure. fast, happens to all of us. And I s asked Mother Teresa, how is it possible to be holy? Mm. How is it possible to be a saint? I never, I've never forgotten what she said to mm. me. She said, Father, if you have the desire, God will do the rest. And I thought about that and I said, yes, it's true because with desire, you know, I could get the best grades at school or sure. I could climb the highest mountain, but do I have that desire to be holy? And I found that I needed to pray for the desire to desire that. Ah, yes. The desire to, and another occasion, actually, uh, you know, I was born just with one hand. It's uh, a period in the 1960s that uh, mothers were given a certain medication to help them sleep and mm -hmm. many children were born with shortened limbs and I wanted it from the mouth of a saint. Uh, why? Yes. Why? And uh, Mother Teresa, she looked at me and she took my hand, she took her hand and she said, Father, you have a small hand, I have a larger hand, but in the eyes of God, they're both hands how true it is because even the most disabled person in the world in the eyes of God they are still a person and she said you know father every night before you go to sleep you need to pray the gospel of the five fingers and I didn't know what that gospel was at the time but she told me it. she said take those fingers of your small hand and say to Jesus you did this for me and the five fingers in other words this event, this fact, God will use for a greater glory, for which one day you will give thanks. Monsignor, what was it like to be in the presence of such holiness, of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, of Pope John Paul II? I mean, imagine that just being in their presence must have been heart-stirring. Initially, one is overawed. Yes. One prepares a whole discourse, or right. what am I going to say? But in fact, one finds oneself in front of someone who is very simple, who mm. knows you already, mm. completely. And so very often you don't have to say anything. Saints love, and they simply love. And when we feel loved, we don't have to say anything. You know, I often think of two people who are in love, you know, they can be in each other's company, but they don't have to go into great discourses about their love. They just know they're being loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the case with the saints. And I think it's especially the case with Jesus and his blessed mother. We can simply allow ourselves to be embraced, loved by them, 
you know, it reminds me of in front of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, that poor peasant, John Vianney, another great saint mm. of mine, who used to sit at the back of the church and come in, and John Vianney would say, well, what are you doing at the back of the church every day? And that poor peasant would say to John Vianney, I look at him and he looks at me. And that was enough. Monsignor, before we finish our time together, is there any last words that you'd like to share with us? I would say very specially that inviting all of us really to look at the person in our midst at this moment mm -hmm. and asking ourselves, how can I be Jesus for them? The greatest gift that God can give us is peace, shalom. Mm -hmm. And how can I be an agent of peace to that person in this very moment. Maybe it's a little prayer, maybe it's a concrete gesture. Imagine that, again going back to Mother Teresa, she would say that the ocean is made up of thousands, millions of drops of water. Yes. But without your specific drop, that ocean would not be the same. Let's make that ocean an ocean of peace and imagine how big that peace would be in the world if we all contributed in this very moment. Let's do that, Monsignor. Monsignor Anthony Figueredo, thank you so much for being with us here today on Voice of the Vatican. May God bless you, Monsignor. Thank you, Ashley.